Good morning. Let us pray before you. Father in heaven, we thank you for this time that we can gather. At this moment, I pray that the Holy Spirit will be with us, that you will speak through me, that you will use me as an instrument, that despite of me, your message will shine through me. I pray that all eyes will be diverted to you, and I pray that all hearts will be drawn to you. For we ask in Jesus' name, Amen. Amen. <coughs> Today, I will talk about success in God's eyes. There is something about the pride and ego and that hubris in humankind that makes him that makes him believe that he has some semblance of control over his destiny that he can by some way change uh, the future this thing about how the tower of babel the builders thought that they could build a tower so high they could reach God. <clears throat> and today millions of uh, people are being sold the idea that if you do this or that, then um, the outcome will be uh, this or that. If you, if you work hard, if you, put it, if you put in the hours, then for sure, someday you'll make it, okay? Whatever um, the measure of success is. So, or perhaps um, if you're talented, okay? You know, the word skillocracy is being thrown around a lot these days. If you have the skills, then if the market uh, needs or demands those kind of skills, then for sure you will have success. And if you don't get there, if you don't make it, then you only have yourself to blame. Maybe you didn't work hard enough, or you didn't work smart enough. <laughs> but even in the secular world, uh, people are realizing that you know, there is more to success than what meets the eye. Um, there are more contributors to success than um, than may be obvious to the casual observer. So, in his book, Outliers, by <coughs> this man called Malcolm Gladwell, he talks about how many of the successful people in the world um, well, although they are very talented and and hardworking, <coughs> but there are also extraordinary circumstances surrounding their lives, which is not very common. Um, you see in anyone else. Okay. So the example he gives is uh, the life of Bill Gates. You guys know who Bill Gates is. Uh, one of the most successful businessman, billionaire, entrepreneur, um, who made his fortune um, in his tech empire when he first wrote a uh, software that has now since become one of the most used uh, software in the world called Windows. Yes, he was a brilliant programmer. <coughs> and yes, he was a hard worker. But you pry it a little bit deeper, you see that there are certain things in his personal life, um, certain advantages that a normal pe person would not um, ever have. Okay. Um, Bill was born into a wealthy family, so he attended an elite private school called Lakeside. And in 1968, <coughs> the mother's club in his school they held a sale to raise funds for school projects. And they had that, that foresight, uh, that wisdom, to buy a computer terminal um, for their school. And during that time, most universities didn't even have a computer terminal. So at just the age of 13, uh, Bill, had, Bill had access to a computer 
and he gained a, a keen interest in, in programming. <coughs> and he would often skip his other classes you know, just to program. And his skills in programming led to even more opportunities to work with companies, um, software companies, and so on and so forth. <coughs> so that by the time um, he, he founded Microsoft seven years later, he had accumulated thousands and thousands of hours of uh, programming experience. Okay? Um, that's not to take away from his hard work. He would be spending um, almost every waking hour programming from 3 a.m. to 6 a.m. He would be in a computer lab. <coughs> Bill was also born at the perfect time, the year 1955. Because at that year, it was the time the personal computer revolution um, started and went to full swing at 1975. Okay. So at 1975, he was 20 years old, just old enough to enter the professional world and start his career, but also young enough and agile enough um, to adopt new technologies and you know to to, to embrace change. <coughs> and if you look at the birth dates of many of the computing pioneers, you'll see that uh, most of them were born around the same time. That's including the founder of Apple Computer, Steve Jobs, okay, who was also born in 1955. Uh, the other example Mal Malcolm talks about is that of the sport of hockey. <coughs> Uh, hockey in Canada. Okay, you would think that the main contributor to success for a player in hockey, a sport of hockey, would be uh, his natural born ability or maybe his physical strength, uh, his physique. But it turned out to be something else. Um, the wife of the psychologist was looking at the birth dates of the players <coughs> written on a handout while she was attending a junior hockey game, okay? And she noticed something strange. A large amount of the boys were born at the start of the year, that is January, March. And <clears throat> this led to um, a discovery of something quite amazing. You see, hockey is uh, pretty big in Canada, and the teams would scout for players at a very young age, maybe five or six. And the leagues the children played in were grouped by age, and the cutoff date um, for each age was January 1st. So, in each league, um, you would have children born at the start of the year who could have up to 11 months of an advantage in growth um, compared to someone born in maybe in December. <coughs> and at that age, every month of growth it's important, right? It's significant. It could mean uh, the difference between winning and losing. And each year, the top players were funneled into a special program where they, where they receive even further, uh, even more special treatment, special training programs, special coaches, special equipment. And so they are, their advantages would, would snowball. Uh, they, would, they would get further and further ahead compared to the others. <coughs> um, yeah. So, it turned out that the biggest contributor to whether a hockey player was successful was whether he was born at the start of the year. Okay. And so you could say that um, your circumstances around you uh, many of which you cannot control, um, such as who you were born to, where you were born, when you were born, those kind of things. It seems that those uh, are quite important factors on where you end up in life. <laughs> so it's the, the biggest factor um, for us to achieve success in life. Is it just luck? Of course not. As Christians, we believe in a higher power, 
that God is ultimately in control of everything that happens in the launch, that is throughout Earth's history, world history, world events, and also in the small, in our own personal lives. We believe as Daniel did when he says, God changes the times and the seasons, he removes kings and raises up kings. That's in the large. And he gives wisdom to the wise and knowledge to those who have understanding. So that's in the small of our personal lives. And we believe in a God who has a greater plan um, and is interested in our good. <laughs> and as Christians, our, our view of success is in total contrast, uh, is totally in opposite with what the world views for. As Christians, we are followers of Christ, and our Master, Jesus, has clearly stated, my kingdom is not of this world. He has, no, he has no interest in material wealth, or the fame and honor that people can give him. Okay? Foxes have holes and birds the air have nests, but the Son of Man has no place to lay his head. He lived a life of humble simplicity. And he tells us that a servant is not greater than his master. So we are to be ready to experience the same kind of trials and hardships that our master Jesus had, <coughs> had to go through when he was on earth. <clears throat> but that doesn't mean that a Christian is forever condemned to a life of poverty. It doesn't mean that a Christian's life will always, always be one of suffering and pain. It is simply that, that God's idea of success <clears throat> is different from what the world views as success. Jeremiah 9, verse 23 says, let not the wise man boast in his wisdom. Let not the mighty man boast in his might. Let not the rich man boast in his riches. But let him who boasts, boast in this, that he understands and knows me. So the knowledge of God is a Christian's uh, utmost priority. And the presence of God in our lives is our measure of success. We surrender our wills into the greater will of God, believing that He knows best and He desires the best for us. Regardless of the circumstances around us, our conscience is as the needle to the pole, unwavering, always pointing in the same direction. And as the prophet Isaiah says, we submit ourselves as clay in the hands of the potter. So today we'll <laughs> we will look at several uh, Bible characters who were successful in their own ways against all odds. And we will try to pick up some points uh, about their character that you know, contributed to their success and see if we can emulate them. <clears throat> so we are all familiar with the, the story of Joseph. At the very young age of 17, when you're full of ambition and hopes for the future, he was sold uh, by his very own brothers, sold to a foreign country, stripped off all his rights, to become a slave in the land of Egypt. And I imagine it would be especially traumatic for him because up to that point in life, he had been a favorite child, favorite child. And he was always used to preference and all the comforts of life. Okay? He enjoyed all the best. And now he was reduced to a slave. But this sudden tragedy worked up, worked in Joseph uh, a change. Okay? As he traveled in that slave caravan, not knowing where he would end up, the Holy Spirit brought to Joseph's mind all the lessons his father taught him about the faithfulness of the God that they serve. And Ellen White writes, One day's experience had been 
the turning point in Joseph's life. This terrible calamity had transformed him from a petted child to a man thoughtful, courageous, and self-possessed. His soul thrilled with the high resolve to prove himself true to God. Under all circumstances to act as became a subject of the King of Heaven. He would serve the Lord with undivided heart. He would meet the trials of his love with fortitude and perform every duty with fidelity. <coughs> and in the house of Potiphar, even though he was a slave, he very quickly gained the favor um, of his new master. Uh, in chapter 29 of, of Genesis, we read in verse 2, The Lord was with Joseph, and he was a successful man. <coughs> and he was in the house of his master, the Egyptian. And his master saw that the Lord was with him, and that the Lord made all he did to prosper in his hand. So the presence of God was so apparent in, in Joseph's life that even an unbelieving um, his, his unbelieving master could see that there was something special about him. That the Spirit of God rested with Joseph. And even when he was wrongfully accused by his master's wife and put into prison, God was still there. And Joseph prospered even in the depths of prison. <coughs> And in verse 21, we see that the Lord was with Joseph and showed him mercy. And he gave him favor in the sight of the keeper of the prison. The keeper of the prison did not look into anything that was under Joseph's authority because the Lord was with him. And whatever he did, the Lord made it prosper. And even when he spent two full years in prison and it seemed that everyone had forgotten him, God was still there. God gave him the gift of interpreting, interpreting dreams and with that it enabled him to, to interpret uh, the dream of uh, Pharaoh and win his confidence, compelling Pharaoh to say, Can we find such a one as this, a man in whom is the Spirit of God? <coughs> so Joseph was promoted as the governor of Egypt and he gained not only material wealth, but also the honor and respect of men. And may I suggest that um, one of the, the key reasons for Joseph's success can be found in verse 9, chapter 39. In speaking to his master's wife, when she tried to seduce him, how then can I do this great wickedness and sin against God. Joseph was keenly aware of God's presence, even though it may, may look like no one else was watching. Joseph believed that there was a God who saw everything and heard everything. Joseph feared God. <coughs> and that fear of God in him led him to a hatred for sin. Proverbs 8 verse 13 says, The fear of the Lord is to hate evil. So first, to allow the presence of God in our lives and to allow God to work for us and with us, we need to have that same deep hatred for sin as Joseph had. The prophet Habakkuk, speaking of God's hatred for sin says, <coughs> You are of purer eyes than to behold evil and cannot look on wickedness. Paul writes in 2 Corinthians 6 verse 14, For what fellowship have righteousness with unrighteousness? And what communion have light with darkness? And what concord have Christ with Belial? So God who is holy cannot um, dwell in the heart of someone who cherishes sin. Isaiah 59 verse 2 says, But your iniquities have separated you from your God, and your sins have hidden his face from you, 
so that he will not hear. Psalm 66 verse 18 says, If I regard iniquity in my heart, the Lord will not hear. <coughs> so when we have that, that hatred for sin, and we understand how much God hates sin, and how sin separates us from God and His presence, then we come to a better um, appreciation for, for what Jesus had done on the cross. Right? Jesus was made to be sin for us. Um, that's the second Corinthians 5, 21. Who knew no sin that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. And Jesus was made a curse for us. For it is written, curse is everyone that hangeth on the tree. He endured the cross, despising the shame for us. With his stripes we are healed. <coughs> so our hearts become filled with gratitude for our Savior. Just like our next character, Mary. Mary, whose heart was filled with gratitude for our Savior, for Jesus, who had forgiven her her sins, who had saved her from, from near death, who had resurrected her brother. Out of this um, gratitude, she goes out and buys a box of uh, expensive perfume, breaks it at the feet of Jesus, and washes his feet with her tears and with her hair. <coughs> the desire was simply to honor the Savior, but to the people around her, she was just acting out of impulse, out of feelings. Some said that she was wasting money, or that money could be used for something uh, good. And the fact was, Mary actually didn't really know what she was doing. Okay. Um, it was not a well thought out plan. And she couldn't really list down the reasons why she was doing what she was doing. <coughs> Spirit of Prophecy writes, Mary knew not the full significance of her deed of love. She could not answer her, her accusers. She could not explain why she had chosen that occasion for anointing Jesus. So she didn't really understand what she was doing, but the Holy Spirit had planned for her, and she had obeyed his promptings. Inspiration stoops to give no reason. An unseen presence, it speaks through mind and soul and moves the heart to action. It is its own justification. That's actually from the, the service group of the And when so so when we we are sitting at the feet of Jesus, like Mary, when we have that close communion with him, <coughs> when we have that intimate relationship, um, that connection, then we can move forward in courage without actually having a clear picture of um, what to expect in the end, or even an explanation for our actions. Okay, just like Caroline was saying in the workshop uh, earlier this week, um, the Holy Spirit can, if we allow Him to, move in us to perform God's will, and then understanding and learning can come later. Right? Spirit of Prophecy writes, Christ told Mary the meaning of her act, <coughs> and in this he gave her more than he had received. In that she poured, she had poured this ointment on my body, he said. She did it for my burial, as the alabaster box was broken, and filled the whole house with its fragrance. So Christ was to die, his body was to be broken. But he was to rise from the tomb, and the fragrance of his life was to fill the earth. Christ had loved us and had given himself for us, an offering and sacrifice to God for a sweet smelling savour. <coughs> and she continues uh, looking into the future. The, the Savior spoke with certainty concerning his gospel. 
it was to be preached throughout the world. And as far as the gospel extended, Mary's gift would shed its fragrance, and the hearts would be blessed through her unsteady act. <coughs> Kingdoms would rise and fall, the names of monarchs and conquerors would be forgotten. But this woman's deed would be immortalized upon the pages, pages of sacred history. Until time should be no more, that broken alabaster box would tell the story of the abundant love of God called fallen grace. So Mary's act of love will be forever etched in history. Her name would be surviving the name of kings and conquerors. And if that's not some measure of success, I don't know what is. <coughs> now let's look at a, a counter example of someone who was born with all the ingredients of success, but it turned out they did not live up to their calling. Samson was born to God-fearing parents. His birth was announced by an angel that he would be a Nazarite, one especially chosen by God to deliver the Israelites and the Philistines. <coughs> he was endowed with supernatural strength, and I should say also um, intellectual ability. Okay. Just think about the riddle he comes up with to confound the Philistines. Or about uh, this idea of, um, of tying torches to the, the fox's tails to, to burn down large uh, areas of the fields of the Philistines. But no amount of talent or ability um, could save Samson from his vices. <coughs> he had a weakness and it caused his downfall. So Samson represents a class of people today who, who take the privileges um, and talents and advantages that God has given us them. Um, and they take it for granted. Like Samson, they take their calling as an inconvenience and a deterrent from them from experiencing the pleasures that the world has to offer. The gifts of God are abused and used for self gratification and for selfish ambition. <coughs> the strength of their youthful vigor and the power of their minds are wasted in the pursuit of pleasure, in the pursuit of things that moth and rust destroy. And if there's one thing we can learn from the story of Samson is that yes, God is merciful, and as long as we live and breathe, there is a chance for us to reconcile and back. But oftentimes, we have to bear the consequences of our actions, whether to the detriment of our physical health, or mental capabilities, or even uh, in hurting other people. In the end, Samson did. Um, turn from his wicked ways and he repented, right? But it cost him his very life. <coughs> Ecclesiastes 7 verse 17 says, Do not be overly wicked, nor be foolish. Why should you die before your time? Now let's go back to the story of the hockey players in Canada. Okay? Remember how, how the kids would get a head start in hockey simply because they were born earlier uh, in the year. Sociologists call this phenomenon the Matthew effect. Okay. And interestingly, the, the name comes from the book of Matthew in the Bible. Um, Matthew chapter 25, verse 29, where Jesus says, For to everyone who has, will more be given, and he will have abundance. <coughs> but from him who has not, even what he has will be taken away. So the world has construed uh, this saying of Jesus into, into a cynical way to say um, the rich will get richer, life is unfair. But of course that isn't what Jesus was trying to teach his disciples. 
the saint which he delivered uh, at the end of uh, the parable of the talents. <coughs> Before this, uh, he talks to them about the signs of the second coming and all the dangers that they would have to face in the last days. And he urges them to watch that fall, for you neither know the day or the time wherein the Son of Man coming. And he gives them this parable to inform that to inform them that they should occupy their time while waiting for the second coming. In service. Okay. He was telling them what their life's purpose should be. And in the parables, okay, so we'll look at the parable. A uh, master goes on a far off journey. This representing Christ who leaves earth to return to heaven. And before he leaves, he entrusts talents to his three servants. <coughs> Five talents to the first one, two for the other, and one to the last according to their ability. So, the talents here do not just represent uh, money, right? but it's every advantage, every blessing, uh, every gift of the Spirit, or every natural ability in influence, in time, and many other things. Okay. <coughs> and in his wisdom and foresight, the master gives each one according to his ability. So Jesus knows our limits, how much we can handle, how any excess would lead us to be maybe proud or maybe caught up in worldly ambition. <coughs> and every one of the servants were expected to invest and multiply their talent to use every talent to its fullest potential and to give an account when the master returns. So likewise, um, all of us have to answer um, as to what we have used the gifts that God has given us on that day of judgment. These talents and abilities are given us not for self-gratification, but they are to be used for the master's work. <coughs> and it's a scary thought right now to imagine if you were to be weighed in the balance and to be found wanting. God expects a profit that is proportionate to the talents given. To whom much is given, much is expected. And the emphasis of this parable that Jesus is telling us is that the work takes the highest priority. That the purpose of our lives on earth is in ministry. It is in serving God and our fellow men. The spirit of prophecy writes, here Christ has presented to the world a higher conception of life than they had ever known. By living to minister for others, man is brought into connection with Christ. The law of service becomes the connecting link which binds us to God and to our fellow men. So what better measure of success is there than to fulfill our life's calling, our purpose? So, so what can we learn today? <coughs> to allow God to use us, first we need, like Joseph, to have the hatred for evil, okay? let's chew evil. The hatred for evil gives us a deeper appreciation of what our Savior has done on the cross. <coughs> That's like Mary. And since we were bought with a price, we no longer serve ourselves and our carnal natures, but we devote our lives in complete service to God. And the work of God is the salvation of souls. So, so God has a plan and purpose for us. <coughs> He's personally interested in our well-being and our happiness. Even the very hairs on our head are numbered. He has a plan to prosper us 
and not the promise. That's to give us a hope in the future. Regardless of whatever bad experiences or failures we had in the past, regardless of the suffering that we may have gone through or are going through at this very moment, He is there. Even when we don't understand the why, like why was I born to these parents? Why was I born at this time? Why am I even here? And Ellen White writes, In the future, the mysteries that here have annoyed and disappointed us will be made plain. <coughs> we shall see that our seemingly unanswered prayers and disappointed hopes have been among our greatest blessings. Someday we'll look back and we'll realize that things, the trials that we have are actually our greatest blessings. If we could see the end from the beginning as God sees, then we would not have it any other way. <coughs> so, in closing, um, time is short. As the prophecies are fulfilled, fulfilled in world events, um, and many of the people in the world are being disillusioned by what is happening around them. Um, we have a responsibility as people who have the truth. We have a work to do. So, so it's my humble prayer that you will allow the Holy Spirit to work in us, you know, change our hearts, our, our motives, and our desires, that this mission, this work, becomes our first priority. And that we will devote our entire being in service. For it is only then that we can achieve true success in our lives and the fullness of joy. Amen.